feud. After making countless lists about kings and queens and learning about the lengths they go to to gain power, it shouldn't come as a surprise to learn that Emperor Nero did some pretty messed up stuff to secure his position of power. Though he would later become an absolute menace to Rome society, he might have picked up this whole violent seizure of power idea from his very own mother, since she pulled a stunt just to get Nero's foot in the door, so to speak. You see, Nero was never supposed to become emperor, but when Emperor Claudius married his niece, Agrippina, Nero's mother, she convinced Claudius to adopt Nero as his very own son, which he did. Mysteriously, Claudius died shortly after all this went down, which meant that Nero was now in line to inherit the throne. Nero became emperor at 17 and in an effort to secure his place of power, he got the bright idea to eliminate anyone who might try and come for his seat of power. And so, he poisoned his stepbrother and later had his mother eliminated as well because he saw how she took out Claudius and he didn't want to meet the same fate. I guess you could say that this was the beginning of the end for the people of Rome and for Nero himself. Number 9, a whole lot of money. This guy was like king, the sudden king of France, or I guess the OG because that came way later. But anyways, in the early morning of June 18th and 64 CE, a huge fire broke out and this blaze burned for 9 days, destroying 14 of Rome's districts and severely damaging 7 others. A large portion of Rome was leveled from the fire. Many citizens lost everything, but rumors started to break out that perhaps Nero was the one who started the fire in the first place. Why? Well, this rumor started after the emperor decided to build an opulent palace for himself that took up a hundred acres. Rather than use the Roman treasury to rebuild the city, he spent it on building his dream palace that he named Domus Aurea or the Golden House. This palace was so expensive to build that Nero was forced to devalue the Roman currency in order to stretch his money. This didn't really mean much to him, but for the rest of the people, this was devastating to the economy. So to explain their misfortunes that arose after the fire, they blamed the emperor, claiming that he was the one who started the blaze, therefore rumors. Historians are still uncertain if that's true or not, since at the time of the fire Nero wasn't even in Rome, but he could have hired someone to carry out the plan. So who knows. Though we may never truly know, but honestly, I wouldn't put it past him. Before we continue talking about the things that made Emperor Nero a mess up dude, let me first take a moment to ask you guys to consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and consider subscribing to the channel to stay a part of the hive, because we'll love that. Number 8, the shaving festival. This is like totally Sweeney Todd in my head. Anyways, in many cultures, there are coming of age celebrations. There's the quinceanera, the bar mitzvah, the bat mitzvah, and plenty of others around the world. Back during the rule of Emperor Nero, he came up with his very own version of a coming of age type of celebration, and it was thrown in honor of his beard. Yes, Nero created an entire festival to honor his facial hair. This takes me right back to grade A when all the boys were like, do you see it? Do you see it? Or like putting mascara on their mustaches? True story. In 59 CE, when Nero was 22 years old, he finally started getting enough facial hair to warrant being shaved. To honor this big event in his life, he invented Juvenalia, or the Games of Youth. This large festival was commissioned all because this guy was going to shave. Now, I'm not someone who grows facial hair like that, so I don't know if shaving your face for the first time is actually a big deal or not. Is it, Chris? Yeah. Is shaving your face for the first time a big deal? It can be. All right, there we go. But anyways, this Juvenilia festival became a showcase for the performing arts. Every kind of theatrical performance was present at this festival, and Nero was known to have participated in some performances, but we'll get to that in a minute. Let's jump to the next point. Number seven, public performances. Let's talk about Emperor Nero, the actor. Nero always had a love for the arts. Many historians believe that if he never became emperor, then he would have become a performer. And some even think his dead dream of becoming a performer is what may have fueled his tyranny in the first place. He wanted his Oscar moment so bad. More than Leonardo DiCaprio. More than anything. And when Agrippina passed away, he found his chance. Nero wanted his popularity to rise, so he began to put on performances of songs he'd written in public. Public. <laughs> Cringe. His active pursuit of the arts did the exact opposite, however. Roman nobles absolutely despised professional actors and actresses, so to see their leader do such a thing was an embarrassment. He even arranged his diet and activities around his artistic endeavors. Despite some of the more gritty details of this cruel emperor, his passion for the arts by all accounts was genuine. It was just super, super desperate, dude. Like, calm down. Number six, personal hype men. I hope you enjoyed that Zoe 101 reference, and yes, it is somehow related to Emperor Nero. Did I think I would ever use Zoe 101? 
an Emperor Nero in the same sentence ever in my life? No. No, I didn't. Goes to show we can't plan life, it just happens. But Nero wanted to make sure that no matter where he went or what happened, that he would always feel like he'd accomplished something awesome. So he hired his own little cheerleading squad of personal clappers. Well, not quite, there's some details missing. When Nero visited Alexandria, he was very impressed with the fashion in which the Egyptians clapped. So he summoned men from Alexandria and made sure more than 5,000 men learned the Alexandrian styles of applause. Then he made them do so vigorously when he sang, You're my wonder wall, clap for me. The men had noticeable thick hair and no rings on their hands so they wouldn't get you know beat up so they could keep clapping. Number five, Antichrist. Was Nero the Antichrist? Well, a lot of people like to think so. Put someone really evil on Earth and that question always seems to appear somewhere. After Nero took his own life in 68 AD, spoiler alert, many people believed that it was a cover up and that he was still alive. Some men even came forward claiming to be Nero himself. Some of these men even stepped forward and sang in public like he used to do. Each of these men were punished, but rumors of his demonic survival continued. Prophets foretold his return, though that may have been more of a metaphor than in a literal sense. Nero was one one of the most monstrous people of the time, so it's not surprising to think he is evil. From biblical forces to his crucifixion of Christians, which we'll get to later, the personification of the Antichrist was said to arise in the form of an emperor, which made Nero really match up quite well with that whole thing, so who knows. Number 4 Messed Up Love so of course, Nero had his fair share of mistresses, but according to rumor, there was none closer than Mummy Dearest. That's right, we got some Oedipus Rex action right now, but that was most likely a rumor perpetuated against a hated tyrant, but still. Who can be sure? He and his mother often rode together in a litter and emerged with suspicious stains on their clothes, alleging what they might have done inside the litter. He also took up a mistress who looked a lot like his mother, which added fuel to the fire. Freud would have had a field day. But whatever love was between them would expire in 59 when Nero plotted to have his mother killed. His string of marriages were just as horrendous. His first wife, Octavia, he drove to take her own life. The second, he kicked to death while she was carrying. The third was his former mistress whose husband he forced to take his own life so she would be free to marry him. Then there was Pythagoras who was Nero's fave ex-slave. In 64 AD they kind of married and Nero dressed as the bride. Nero also married another man named Sporus who he also took away his manhood should I say so that he could be more of a woman in 67 AD. He took after his uncle Caligula when it came to taking advantage of the wives of his senators which brings us to number 3 animal games. I know, you know where I'm going with this. If you know where this is going, trigger warning folks, this man was warped if you hadn't figured that out. As I was saying, he was a really big fan of putting his senators into uncomfortable positions, putting them through massive ridiculous orgies, but he also devised an utterly horrendous and bizarre sex game where he would dress up as an animal covered in animal pelts, come out of a cage and attack men and women tied to stakes. But then when he got his like, you know, fill, he would go to one of his husbands to finish the job. In a way, he kind of sounds like an OG furry if furries were violent, but at the same time, Nero took his fetish way farther than anyone was comfortable with. Consent is sexy unless you're an emperor apparently who literally takes lives if he doesn't get his way. He also allegedly had booths set up along the river he traveled filled with mechanisms for pleasure and concubines role playing innkeepers for his pleasure. That could be a rumor but honestly I wouldn't put it past him. Number 2 Night Lights Just when you think things have gotten as worse as they could get, it gets worse. But of course this is Nero we are talking about not Robert De Niro, he's a nice guy. They didn't have electricity back then, obviously right, so at night they had to have a way of lighting up the night. Now, most logical people would be like, yeah, let's light a few torches, use some fire, but Nero had a darker idea that conveniently humiliated and tormented the people he hated the most, the Christians. When Rome burned, Nero went on to shift the blame to the Christians. Thousands of the followers were rounded up and punished in incredibly cruel ways, but most notably he built pyres, covered them with tar, and used them as torches for an imperial festival. Amongst the burning bodies, he had naked dancers come come out and frolic around the poor victims. Going back to the antichrist thing we mentioned earlier, I think this really makes like for an open and shut case. And last one, time to go. Okay, let's do a quick recap here. Bestiality, matricide, unalived his first wife and his second along with his kid. He basically bankrupted Rome by building his golden palace, raised taxes to pay for it, uh, violated consent in so many brutal ways. Nero to zero. 
Am I right, folks? The Emperor's Rome began to crumble, and his officials were not happy. He would soon be declared public enemy number one. Not long after a Roman governor renounced Nero and his legion was defeated in Germany, it was only a matter of time for the tyrant. The Praetorian Guard charged with guarding the Emperor himself renounced him, and he was officially declared an enemy of the people by the Senate on June 8th in 64. Nero knew he was done for, so rather than face the masses and account for his crimes, Nero took his own life to beat them to it. His last words were apparently what an artist dies in me and he died with his current mistress at his side she ensured he at least had a very decent burial but that was that for the tyrannical ruler at number 10 population it's pretty messed up just how many slaves there were in ancient Rome. In their society, wealthy people owned dozens if not hundreds of slaves to do their menial work. In ancient Rome, anyone could be sold into slavery. No matter your race or background, if you could work, you could be bought and sold. Historians believe that about 90% of the free people in Italy by the 1st century BCE had ancestors who were slaves. At one point, the Roman Senate debated having slaves wear uniforms to be able to distinguish them from the rest of society, but they ultimately decided against it when they realized just how many slaves there were. One ancient Roman politician once said, quote, It was once proposed in the Senate that slaves should be distinguished from free people by their dress. But then it was realized how great and danger this would be if our slaves began to count us. End quote. They literally couldn't afford to let the slaves know how many other slaves there were because if they would have known they outnumbered the other members of society, this could have led to a revolt. I mean, there were slave revolts regardless, but we will get to that later. At number nine, lifestyle. Ancient Roman slaves experienced different lifestyles and living conditions based on a number of factors, often linked to their occupations. Slaves who didn't have a specific skill or trade were often used in mines and agriculture, and those were the harshest conditions that they could have been subjected to. Oftentimes, they were literally worked to death, and since they didn't have any human rights in the eyes of the Romans, they were often overlooked and simply replaced. On the other hand, household slaves received more humane treatment. They were treated better by their masters, and sometimes they were able to get some money in order to buy their freedom. If they were able to buy their freedom, the slaves would become freedmen, which was a social class between slaves and free people. Before we continue discussing the hard lives of slaves in ancient Rome, make sure you guys smash that thumbs up button if you're thoroughly entertained so far, and maybe even consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Spartacus. At one point, a group of Roman slaves revolted, and though they eventually lost their battle, they survived a pretty long time thanks to one famous slave named Spartacus. Spartacus was a slave who escaped a gladiatorial training camp and recruited thousands of other slaves to fight for their freedom alongside him. For the slaves, Spartacus was their symbol of hope and their leader. This slave army was able to defy Roman authorities for two years with freedom in their sights, but unfortunately those dreams were crushed when Roman general Crassus crushed Spartacus and his army. After Spartacus Spartacus was killed, the authorities came for the rest of the slaves in the army and they were severely punished. 6,000 slaves who took part in the revolt were crucified and this was almost a warning to the other slaves against trying to revolt again. Spartacus became a legend but it wasn't enough to free the Roman slaves. At number 7, Ownership In ancient Rome, slavery and slave ownership was such a common practice that pretty much everyone owned slaves, regardless of social status. Even some of the poorest Roman citizens would own one or two slaves. Obviously, the more money you had back then, the more slaves you could afford. In Roman Egypt, the average artisan owned about two or three slaves each. Emperor Nero was known to have owned over 400 slaves who lived and worked in his home in the city, but his numbers are eclipsed by a wealthy Roman named Gaius Caecilius Isidorus, who according to historical records owned 4,166 slaves at the time of his death. That just gives you an idea of just how many people were sold into slavery in the first place. At number 6, freedom. Earlier I mentioned that Roman slaves had the chance to buy their freedom. It was a lengthy process, but this gave a lot of slaves hope for a better life. Things weren't always better after buying their freedom though, and many of them sold themselves back into slavery because things were tough. The process of buying your freedom as a slave was called manumission. This could be achieved in a number of ways. Slave master could grant their slave freedom as a reward for their service and loyalty. The slave could pay their master a sum of money to be freed, or sometimes a slave master could just find it convenient to let their slave go. Most slave masters who chose that last option to free their slave for their own benefit were merchants who needed someone to be able to sign contracts on their behalf 
and since slaves weren't allowed to represent their masters from a legal standpoint, they would be freed, but would still work for their master. You also had to be over the age of 30 to buy your freedom, so if you were lucky to live that long, then there was hope of being freed, but with the average life expectancy in ancient Rome being about 28 years or so, and with the living conditions of many slaves, they would be lucky to get that opportunity. At number 5, Demand In ancient Rome, there was an incredibly high demand for slaves, but since there were so many slaves in Rome, there was always work for them. Oftentimes, people sold themselves or their children into slavery in order to pay off their debts, so when it came to being bought, that came pretty easy. Other than public office, slaves were used for almost every activity in ancient Rome. The most common slave trade was mining because workers were always in demand, mostly due to the high level of danger that came with the job and the fact that many slaves were injured or died while working in the mines, and slave masters needed to keep replacing those who could no longer work. Domestic labor and farming were also high demand jobs for slaves back then. Back then, the logic behind using slave labor for these types of jobs was that quote, free labor should be used in unhealthy places. End quote. Basically, they believed that it was better to have a slave pass away on the job than a free person because it would impact their business less. At number 4, Procurement The way that slaves were acquired in ancient Rome was pretty messed up, I will say. Typically, slaves were acquired through four different ways. They would be brought in as war captives, as victims of pirate raids, by trade or by breeding. During the early expansion of the Roman Empire, many war captives were turned into slaves. The pirates from Sicilia, located in what is now modern day Turkey, did business with the Romans and supplied them with a lot of their slaves. The pirates would bring their slaves to the island of Delos, which back then was considered considered to be the international center of slave trading. The slave trade was such a big deal back then that it has been recorded that on at least one occasion, 10,000 people were traded as slaves and shipped back to Italy in one day. This was a big business opportunity for a lot of people, but of course, no one ever considered the lives of the people they were buying and selling. At number 3, Fugitives As you can imagine, life as a slave in ancient Rome or at any period of time wasn't easy. Living conditions were poor, it was dangerous, and no one should ever be treated like that or used for free labor. Many slaves have been known to escape and obviously the same went for those in ancient Rome. Slaves running away from their masters was a common thing back then, and to deal with it, slave owners would hire professional slave catchers to hunt hunt down, capture, and return the escaped slave back to their owner. For slave owners who wanted to take matters into their own hands, they would advertise rewards for those who could return their slaves, or they would just try and locate their slave themselves. Some slave owners had ways of preventing their slaves from getting away, like using collars with instructions on where to return the escaped slave, much like a dog collar, which is just dehumanizing. At number 2, Revolts In Roman times, slave revolts were pretty common. There have been a number of recorded slave revolts in Roman history. I mentioned the one that was led by Spartacus, but there's another pretty famous Roman slave revolt that was led by a man named Eunice. Eunice led a revolt that happened in Sicily from 135 to 132 BCE. It is said that Eunice believed himself to be a prophet and claimed to have several mystical visions. Eunice was able to persuade a number of other slaves to follow him when he performed a trick where sparks and flames came out of his mouth. They believed that he was magical and so they followed him to try and fight back against the Roman forces. Unfortunately, they were defeated, but the example that they set is believed to have inspired yet another slave revolt in Sicily later in 104 to 103 BCE. And finally, at number one, totally normal. Probably the most messed up thing about life as a Roman slave was just how normal slavery was in society. I mean, the Roman people were so invested in their slaves that they continuously tried to crush their revolts and they tried everything in their power to keep them from escaping. Even the sheer number of slaves that were in their society just shows how important slavery was to them. Back then, slavery was just an unquestioned institution. For many, it was just a normal part of life, which is actually quite frightening when you think about it. There is no recorded history of Romans ever questioning slavery in their society, and all economic, legal, and social forces in Rome at this time worked hard to try and preserve slavery as part of their society. To the ancient Romans, slaves were seen as the direct opposite of free people, which they believed was a necessary balance that they needed in their society. They never completely got rid of slavery either. Though they did try and create new rules and laws to make life as a slave more bearable, they were still bought and sold into servitude and were seen as property and lesser people. Number 10, three fights and a funeral. This first point is still up for debate as many historians are still trying to confirm how this whole gladiator thing started, but one possible launching point for these bloody Olympics was a blood rite at funerals. They served as a kind of violent eulogy, so instead of standing up in front of the mourning families and reading, I don't know, like a haiku or a poem, 
They uh, fought out their feelings. Healthy. When esteemed aristocrats died, families would hold bouts between slaves beside the grave. Like right there. Front row seat for the corpse. This was to demonstrate the virtues that were demonstrated by the dead in life. This presentation of blood in battle also could have stood in for human sacrifice. As you can guess, the tradition would gather quite the crowd and eventually evolved into the epic gladiator battles we know today. Julius Caesar, for instance, organized a massive gladiator fight between hundreds of warriors to honor the death of his father. By the end of the first century BC, the gladiator games were state funded and much, much larger. Number 9. No heckling. When the Colosseum was built in 80 AD, about 50 to 80,000 fans of Roman combat, they would pour in. The energy was high. This was their only source of entertainment, really. They weren't watching The Witcher season 2 back then, so you know, they had to do this. So some fans would get so into the action that they, of course, would heckle. Well, just like a comedy show, they too can hear you heckle. You're throwing off their entire performance and that's a no-go. Today, a 21-year-old usher will politely ask you to keep it down, but in Roman Colosseum days, you don't get a warning. One of Rome's more violent emperors, Domitian, was pretty die-hard when it came to the Colosseum and the games. So much so that one day, a guy in the crowd heckled a gladiator, probably talked smack about his oiled up abs, or you know, smile, that's always a fun one, we hear that a lot. So Domitian had him pulled from the audience to the center of the arena where a group of aggressive dogs finished him off. How terrifying is that? No heckling, ever, even now, stop. Hey Taylor, yeah? stop. Number eight, vegetarians. So believe it or not, the diet of a gladiator was largely vegetarian, though it wasn't really like they had any choice. It was expensive to keep these fearsome warriors and meat wasn't always easy to come by, so they had to fill in the gap with other sources. Based on the excavation of 22 gladiators, their bones revealed that their typical food was wheat, barley, and beans. How they could tell this from their bones, no idea. Science, man. There was little sign of any meat or even dairy as well. However, they did drink another kind of mysterious substance. This study was carried out by the Medical University of Vienna in Austria and the University of Bern in Switzerland. And not only did it reveal the aforementioned vegetarian diets, it also showed evidence that they consumed a health boosting tonic made out of plant ashes. It can be compared to the way we consume magnesium tablets or vitamin C. It was believed that it helped restore gladiators after a battle. Now, obviously, 22 was a a pretty small sample size, but hey, that's still at least that percentage, so. Number seven, death before combat. With most of these Roman gladiators, they are trained, they understand a specific style of combat, and they're paired off with an opponent that's somewhat equal. But not all of these gladiators are UFC fighters. Not all of them are Russell Crowe, okay? A great amount of gladiators were criminals who were forced to fight each other in the name of entertainment. These prisoners of war were not really on board with fighting a lion with a dagger. They understood that this was probably a one-way trip, so many of them took their own lives before the combat even began. This one story is haunting, but it makes total sense. 29 prisoners were all set to fight these crazy animal battles in front of thousands, but they all ended up strangling each other. They took each other's lives because that was easier to them than walking into this night Nightmare. That's horrible. The reason this was an easier choice to make was because saying no would lead to an even more painful and still public execution. Number six, aphrodisiac. The fanaticism around gladiator warriors was like the fanfare around the Beatles, the Stones, and Justin Bieber, like all around, all combined. You might even argue that they were some of the very first celebrities, and that was mostly due to their sex appeal. They were sex bombs. Ooh, ooh, beefy men. Yeah. Roman women believe that even their sweat was an aphrodisiac, like Old Spice deodorant. The gladiators won massive fame and even had their own action figures as children would make their clay dolls emanating their favorites. Their image would be placed on walls in public spaces and even endorsed products. Women wore hair jewelry dipped in gladiator blood or mixed their sweat into hair cream or cosmetics. To have a dream about one was said to foretell a fortunate marriage. There was even graffiti in Pompeii that depicted one fighter who would catch women in his nets at night. Like a sexy boogeyman. Woo! -hoo. Number five, blindfolded. Remember that last scene in the movie Dodgeball when Vince Vaughn blindfolds himself and then still wins somehow? What a moment in time. There were no dry eyes in the entire theater. But what if I told you gladiators would also pull this trick off? 
Yeah, in order to get crowds to return for these massive death events, they would need to change the formula up from time to time. Sometimes they would have cheap beer nights, which helped, but a new idea that worked was referred to as andabada, where gladiators wore blindfolds during combat. They would also leave the armor inside. Yeah, sometimes just battling in sandals and cloth. And you thought Marco Polo made you anxious. Mm. They would save these events for the more brutal criminals, so people weren't just forced to, you know, wrap up their eyes and shake their legs into an arena. It was, you know, they were bad, so it's kind of like, mm, it was fine, I guess. Number four, women fought as gladiators. This was news to me. I wouldn't do it because tiny. Uh, as we might have already established, gladiators were usually built from slaves, warriors, and sometimes even volunteers. Good for you. And apparently women were not exempt from that. Female slaves were quite frequently condemned to face their fate in the arena, though some volunteered because, you know, there were Xena warriors. Some of the time it was as genuine contenders, while some were sent simply for the entertainment or embarrassment. Emperor Dominion, for example, loved to pit women against people with dwarfism because he thought it was funny. Neither the women or the little people were taken seriously, as few appeared to have proven themselves in combat. However, some still did, rest assured. The timeline as to when they started doing this is unclear, but there are records of at least two women referred to as Amazon and Achillea. Epic names, right? Whoa. They are depicted on a marble relief dating back to the second century AD, and it says that they fought in an honorable draw. Women also joined in the animal hunts, but by 200 AD, their participation ended when Emperor Septimus Severus banned them in the games. Damn you, Severus Snape. Number three, nets for weapons. When you're walking into that arena, you're eyeing down this eight foot six beast in front of you. He has like 12 abs. It doesn't look good. His name's Gore or something terrifying. You're gonna want a nerf bat or two. You're gonna want a weapon. Now, weapons in the Colosseum were a necessity, of course, but can you believe some gladiators would use nets to fight? Nets. Oh. Yes. Yeah, nets, like they're catching butterflies or co-hosts. This class was referred to as the Ritari. Now their combat style was built around the ways of fishermen. Yeah, Popeye versus Maximus, place your bets people. Realistically, these warriors looked a lot more like Aquaman. They would fight with a trident and a net. They would take their time. They would avoid these mighty swings from these big dudes. And then when the time was right, they would just go and then they would just poke the shit out of them with a trident over and over in hopes that it would, you know, end. It helps to be quick, but if you've seen Game of Thrones, you know that spears don't always work. Number two, are you not entertained? Great title, I know. Fun fact, gladiators for the most part didn't actually try and kill each other in the ring, just like wound. Yeah, take a second to digest that beside the Hollywood movies you know and love. But the truth was gladiators had a code they had to follow and killing each other wasn't a part of it. Why? Well, because gladiators were expensive investments and seeing your prize fighter that you've like forked hundreds and thousands of dollars into die in a fight would hurt your wallet big time. Also, most of them knew each other and were besties, so they didn't even want to. Contests were usually single combat between two even opponents and referees oversaw the whole thing. If one got injured enough, the ref would probably just, you know, call it. Often enough, the bout would end after both participants gave an entertaining show and would leave with honor. They were like, yeah, you're entertained. Good, we're good to go, right? Cool. How However, their life expectancy was still short. Historians estimate that gladiators had one in five or one in 10 chance of ending up dead after the bout, either from being killed or wounded, gangrene, you know the whole deal. And finally, coming in at number one spot, naval battles. Okay, so I mentioned the Aquaman gladiators with the nets and the, you know, pokey poke tridents. That's absolutely insane. But have you heard about the staged naval battles? What a spectacle this would have been. The Colosseum was once flooded, which I'm sure took a hot minute or two. Then these ships would come out and then it would be like medieval times, but with a splash zone, right? These ships were designed to resemble these vessels from famous battles, but the bottom of the ship was flat because the water was only five feet deep. Can't have the bottom of the ship scraping against all that sand and bones and stuff. No, you'll get stuck. The water was only five feet deep, so obviously they couldn't use real ships. It wasn't always violent reenactments either. Sometimes they would fill the Colosseum and nude synchronized swimmers would come out. Nice, nothing like an in-ground pool filled with gladiator bones. Also, goggles weren't invented until the 14th century, so yuck. These naval battles were doing so well that Emperor Domitian devoted an entire lake to them. It's kind of like Harry Potter Goblet of Fire. They would just go to this lake and then watch these insane battles or performances, you know? Hashtags 
Slytherin, I don't know. Once the shows moved over there permanently, they then used the floodgates and trap doors to hide animals inside of. What a nice upgrade. What a show. Also, this is terrifying. Number 10, Parties of Poison. Hindsight is 2020, which I find more ironic than ever since the whole thing that happened and is continuing to happen. Today we know that lead, especially in large doses, is not good. It's poison. But a lot of the pipes that the Romans used in their plumbing were made from lead. Their water had 100 times more lead in it than the water that came from the springs, which means every time they drank water, they were poisoning themselves. Some side effects include behavioral changes as well as weakening organs and vital signs, etc., which may explain some of the more questionable emperor behaviors or the fall of the Roman Empire because people got nuts. But to add insult to injury, the Romans used to sweeten their wine with something called sapa. Sapa is lead acetate, the sugar of lead, which is, and it's also a salt, which is confusing, and therefore poison. Since Romans could down as much as two liters of wine in one sitting, they were slowly poisoning themselves, first with water, then with the wine. Speaking of wine, moving on to number nine, we have you better love wine. If you're a vodka or a beer person, you might not fit in while partying with the Romans, especially if you hate wine. Wine was the lifeblood of ancient Roman parties. Wine was drunk at every stage of the Roman party, but it had to be diluted with hot or cold water. Unlike how we drink wine today, which would be crazy if you were to dilute it. Whoa. It was looked down upon to drink wine in its purest form. It was served out with ladles, usually by naked and attractive male slaves. To heat the water, the Romans used special boilers, but if you really wanted to be bougie, they would add snow to make it cold. Considering they didn't have fridges back then, imagine the lengths they would have to go to to keep the snow cold. Beyond temperature, Romans absolutely drooled for calda and mulsum. Calda was great for cold nights, it was kind of like a mold wine, it was served hot and infused with spices. Molda was infused with honey and a lot sweeter. I want to try and make both. Maybe I will on my Instagram. Let me know if I should in the comments below. Minus the lead, of course. Number eight, seating charts. If you have ever been involved in a wedding, you know how important a seating chart is. Or like even in school, when you're like assigned desks, it's a big deal. You could end up sitting next to your uncomfortable cousin or beside your smelly Aunt Sue. It could determine whether the conversation blows or it's stagnant the entire night. Ugh, hate that. Romans understood the matchmaking game when it came to banquets. It was a pretty big deal. Where you sat determined your station and overall how liked you were. They had a three couch system called the triclinium. The most honored guests would sit on the couch in the center next to the hosts on the right. But if you were on the couch on the left, it kind of meant that you weren't as big of a deal. Sorry. Eventually as parties got bigger, so did the three couch rule extend to a huge semicircular couch in the middle that could hold about 12 people. Number seven, gladiator fights. We just did a video on this, Taylor and I, go check it out. Now, parties weren't just about eating, drinking, and socializing, there had to be entertainment, of course. Roman parties were designed around the five senses, taste, touch, smell, sight, and hearing. So of course there were the ancient Roman bards jamming out some earworms, but what was there to look at? You could only watch someone play the harp for so long. Next up on the entertainment list was acrobats, dancing girls, even mimes, which I was surprised to learn, plus trained exotic animals. If you were more like the charcuterie and like a quiet evening kind of person, you might enjoy poetry readings. But what really got the party started was an epic gladiatorial battle. Nothing like putting sharp objects in drunk people's hands. But that wasn't all they did. Parties were a big deal and nobles loved to outdo each other, so sometimes they went too far. More than once it got out of hand, but the most famous was during the reign of Emperor Elgabalus. He wanted to shower his dinner guests with flowers, so he built a full ceiling filled with them, but the flowers somehow ended up smothering some of his guests to death because he just kind of went overboard. Death by Roses. That's a poem title right there. Stick to poetry nights, my friends. Number six, Saturnalia. One of the most popular Roman festivals, it was kind of like an early Christmas celebration, kind of, except it wasn't at all. It was actually about the god Saturn, not Christ. Oops, but it did take place in December. December 17th, to be precise, for three days. But people loved it so much, it soon got extended to seven, a whole week. 
All work and businesses were suspended, so better do your shopping on the 16th. Slaves were even temporarily free to do as they pleased, even moral restrictions were eased. A mock king was chosen, and candles, wax fruit, wax statues were all given as presents. The practice of candle giving was to symbolize the sun returning after the winter solstice. A statue of Saturn bound at the feet would be untied and invited to join the party. The houses were adorned with wreaths and greenery, kind of like Christmas, and singing, dancing, gambling were all common features. So kind of like Mardi Gras and Christmas combined. Number five, the Black Banquet. A prank that went down in history. Don't worry, this is nothing like GOT's red wedding. Thank goodness. Emperor Dominion had a pretty sick sense of humor and decided to host a party about it. In 90 AD, he invited a crowd of aristocrats to a banquet at Palatine Hill. When they arrived, the entire palace was decorated in black. Black velvet drapes, marble, everything was painted black like the Rolling Stones song. Even the food was black and everything was illuminated by funeral lamps. Naked serving boys were painted from head to toe in black paint and served food and drink to all the guests. When they sat down, their place marks were, were tombs with their names on it and instead of lush couches, they sat on cement slabs. So basically he was like, yeah, sit in your own grave. Dominion had killed several senators in the past so everyone believed that they were never gonna get out of there alive. It was like a huge metaphor for their own deaths. The emperor himself babbled about death and decay the entire night. So after the party was over and the guests made it home with their necks intact, Dominion sent gift baggies with their tombstones and onyx plates and a now clean serving boy ready to do their bidding. Turns out the whole thing was a prank and the emperor was back at the palace laughing his butt off. Number four, Bacchanalia. The party that was so wild, it got banned. One word, orgies. The Romans dug that kind of kinky shindig, but they like to pretend they didn't. Bacchanalia, the back guy, is a term used to describe a drunken, debaucherous party at frat houses or sororities, which isn't far off from the heyday. The Bacchanal celebrates the god Dionysus, also known as Bacchus, literally the god of wine and a damn good time. The celebration could include massive feasts, ritual parades and performances, and people carrying clusters of grapes around, and of course, wine. Lots and lots of wine. It used to just be held by women three times a year, but soon men were slowly admitted to the festivities and they started making it happen about five times a month. But this was the breeding ground for scandal as it was rumored orgies and even human sacrifice occurred. So they were banned in 186 BCE, and if you ban something, you'll only make it more popular so the celebrations continued covertly. So if you're into that kind of stuff, maybe forgo the human sacrifice, but there it is. Number three, power play party. I've never lived within the aristocracy. I'm a blue collar gal. I'm never gonna know what it's like to be that rich, but I'm pretty sure this kind of who can throw the bigger party mentality hasn't really changed. In ancient Rome, parties were an opportunity to show off the amount of power a nobleman had. As soon as guests arrived, the extravagance and the rarity of the food, the vessels with which they were presented were all judged as soon as they were seen. Wine goblets and jugs had to be functional yet exquisite, made from luxurious materials like gold gold, silver, and precious stones. Back then, a middle class family could afford silverware, so imagine what the nobles could do. This display of wealth played the long game, and it could mean political favors could be made down the road. So, sneaky sneaky. Number two, Party Island. This is where it gets really dark. Ever sipped on a Capri Sun? Well, this story may taint that memory, so fair warning. The island of Capri became a rich retreat for the Roman aristocracy, known for its sadistic debauchery. Emperor Tiberius Tiberius laid claim to this island as a haven for his horrendous and horrific, horrific behavior. He brought really young, too young male and female people of the night to serve him at his villa. The island became a kind of party place with absolutely no limits. From orgies in the caves to tormenting his servants on the rack as entertainment, Tiberius seemed to be the god Pan incarnate. In fact, he acted like it too. He made all of his participants slaves dress up as nymphs and goats while performing lewd acts. The island even became known as Goat Island with Tiberius being called the Old Goat. Ugh. Unless you enjoy dangerous games and gross parties, this definitely wasn't the party island fit for anyone. And last but not least, number one, Caligula. Caligula's parties, let's not go there. If you're a fan of Roman history, then you are familiar with the two most horrific emperors that ever were. One of them was Caligula. Though he started out pretty good, after an extreme bout of fever, his disposition entirely changed. Maybe it was because of the lead, we don't know. Many believed he was insane, as his cruelty knew no bounds, even when it came to joy 
joyous occasions. Caligula's thing was that he liked to embarrass the wives of his officials for some reason, and also his officials. He would force specifically married couples to his banquets, and then steal the wives away throughout the night and then violate them against their wishes. But his torment doesn't end there. He would then relay to the entire party everything that he did in graphic detail and enjoy the frozen shock on everyone's faces because they couldn't do anything about it. It's no wonder he was eventually assassinated. Even at a party, this guy knew how to kill the mood. He wasn't the only emperor to turn the dial on creepy, Tiberius, when the party started, but if you had to choose whose party to go to, this one plus Tiberius, both of them, just don't go near them. Go to another time frame. Just imagine it otherwise. Number 10, population. Here's the thing, folks. When you do the whole slave thing, you may need more than one. Maybe two. Okay, 10 tops, no more than that. Okay, maybe like thousands. Yes, this was true of ancient Rome. While it is difficult to calculate the exact number of people who were slaves, some historians speculate that at least 10% of the population were slaves. And if that number doesn't feel right to you, it's because some say it could really be as high as 20%. That's a lot of folks. And honestly, if we're to study history and understand the mistakes of the past, well, having that many slaves means there's probably more people to join in the angry mob and the revolts because you have slaves and people don't like that. Number nine, the act itself. I know I didn't have to tell you this, but I'm gonna tell you anyway, the act itself. Now, just an idea, and this is gonna make some corporate overlords faint, but when I say this, maybe we shouldn't put our fellow man in chains and shackles and be forced to complete hard labor for no wage and they're treated like dirt. Just, just an idea, less than dirt, actually, sometimes. Look, I know sometimes we as humans don't get along. As a Canadian, playing hockey in school always changed my behavior. I think Chris would agree with this too. We could be the sweetest students ever, but when we get out of that rink, something changes. You start seeing Stanley Cups and Maple Leafs and probably a forced deal with a very popular coffee shop chain. But all that seething Canadian rage never made me want to treat people the way slaves were treated. What I'm getting at is, even at our worst, we would never do that. I wouldn't do that, Chris wouldn't do that, we're not gonna do that. Number eight, work to work. I guess one slightly good thing about being a Roman slave is that well, if you could even call a good thing in that, really, is that there was a chance to work for your freedom. Literally slaving away in the hot Roman sun for years just so you can get your freedom, so you can work and sweat in the hot Roman sun for years for very little pay. And that's so great when you when I put it that way. I hope there's a sunscreen budget. Some slaves could buy their freedom, some were freed by their masters, and getting freed was actually a big deal as there were sometimes a ceremony where a slave and then a public official would touch the head of the slave of the staff. Abracadabra, alakazam, wishy-washy, sloshy, poof. Magic, you're, you're free now. So simple, right? Almost like it didn't have to happen in the first place. Huh? Number seven, second class citizen. You may have heard this term thrown around a little bit, but becoming a citizen of Rome was kind of a big deal. Your social status kind of defined how you lived. You'd think being a slave sweating away in the Mediterranean sun wasn't bad enough. There was a lot of red tape to go with this as well. So many rules. When freeing slaves, no more than a hundred at a time could be freed. Okay, but I have a few issues with that. If your house has a hundred slaves, you probably ain't gonna give up a hundred in the first place. Now the rule says under no circumstances can you free a hundred slaves at one time. Okay, what if you break it up? Say you do 50 at a time. What if you do 99 slaves and leave one until later? What if you release one at 11.59 and then the rest at midnight? What if some of the slaves are missing limbs from hard labor and only count as half? Let's say you release 99 and one half slaves at 11.59 and the last half at midnight. You see what I'm saying? There's too many rules. I can't deal with that, man. Too many rules. No. Number six, foundation. Okay, everyone loves Rome. Who doesn't? You got your legions, you got your coliseums, you got your aqueducts. Oh, it's a big deal. As it turns out, the Romans were good at building stuff. Most impressive, honestly, was the roads. I know that's not as cool as the buildings, but trust me, anyone who actually knows architecture in the comments is gonna quietly nod their head and agree with me. And so. Yeah, yeah, he's right, actually, yeah. Roman roads last 2,000 years. Toronto is still waiting for the Edmund and Crosstown. That's a local inside joke, but trust me, it'll slap. Where the hell is that thing? Come on. The point I'm getting at is Romans built a lot of great stuff, and it could not have been so without the efforts of the many slaves who built their roads, tended their farms, and did just about everything. Honestly, it's, it was built on the whole thing. Number five, collars. Collars were made for animals, dogs, cattle. No one likes wearing them. Well, maybe except a certain anthropomorphic community, that is. 
You know the one I'm talking about. Sadly though, Roman slaves did wear collars, similar to dog tags in the military. It's a form of identification. and. That you know that that said person is a slave, which in case you didn't know was super uncool. Anyone who says otherwise is just off. Or if I had to take a guess, they're the same people who would choose to side with Caesar's Legion and fall out New Vegas. You know gosh darn well that the NCR is the right choice, and or also leading the Las Vegas Strip by yourself. I mean, come on, who doesn't want to be the CEO of three luxurious casinos in the Mojave Wasteland? But I digress. The collars are naughty. The bads don't do that. Especially the explosive ones. Don't, I don't like it. Number four, currency. There's something that just tickles my fancy when thinking about Roman gold coins. Maybe it's my inner historian, or maybe it's because my persona is Wario. Wario likes gold. Can't blame me. However, the Roman denarius is not what we're talking about right now. I'm talking about the ancients' other favorite currency, flesh and bone. Unfortunately for the slaves of Rome, they were traded, bought, and sold like an item, or used as a currency. When you build a whole society around such a horrible thing, this just kind of makes sense. It adds up. To make bad things even worse, sometimes when Rome was expanding or the Gauls got a little too close to Rome and some borders were being exchanged, it often meant that some slaves would change hands too. And by that, I mean they were taken and put to work for another boss that was probably less nice to them since they didn't come from the same area. Boy, history sure is mean sometimes. I tell you, that history. Oh, oh boy. Number three, the bathhouse. I didn't think this was going to be a secret to anyone, but the slaves weren't just working in the fields or putting up some arches that last longer than most marriages. No, some poor folks had the duty of polishing pearls, smoking the salami, waxing the carrot, and finger fishing for clams. I think you get my point. Yes, the oldest profession in the world, however, it wasn't exactly a profession in this case, more like it, it had to be done or there would be consequences. Eesh. For me, brothels might sound great on paper, but when you're laying down in the doctor's office and he's trying to scrape barnacles off your piece of deal, well, I can't say I didn't warn you. Number two, gladiators. Guys, I actually learned something today. I know, right? Imagine little old me learning something. Gladiators, you know them, you love them. The movie is okay in my opinion. The warriors who duked it out in the Roman Colosseum weren't always brought in chains. Some were volunteers actually. Honestly, as I was writing this, I thought to myself, well gosh darn it there feller, if that don't sound like that's the Hunger Games. That's right, being dragged away from your family and forced to fight in blood sport. All you're missing is Donald Sutherland's buttery smooth voice. I also can't help myself in mentioning this, but probably the first battle royale ever too. So maybe it's just a part of us. Something about the last man standing that we love so much, and why I want to spend all my savings on Fortnite skins. Number one, thumbs up, very nice. Listen, we've all seen the movie. Joaquin Phoenix is standing there looking all Roman-like and looking into the heart of Russell Crowe, knowing damn well this will probably be his last blockbuster. That's just, sorry, that's just how it goes. There in suspense, the audience waits to see what his thumbs do to decide his fate. Well, this is true of the Roman slaves in the Colosseum, however, there's a couple things that differ from the movie. One, being not all who went into battle perished, and two, the thumbs down might be what you want, actually, not the thumbs up. Meaning that the thumbs up meant, yes, go ahead and finish the plebeian. A thumbs down, a fist, or even waving a cloth might have meant, no, spare the poor soul, have mercy. Kicking off the list at number 10, party hard. The term boot and rally was added to the Urban Dictionary in 2002, but Romans were riding that wave out a long, long time ago. They knew how to get down, well rather they knew how to get it up. Ancient Romans would often make themselves puke in order to continue eating and drinking. How gross is that? What would normally be a red flag at a house party was actually a sign of respect back then. But it was business. These parties, these long exhausting banquets, attending these was a sign of social standing. So you wanted to be around the longest. You wanted to drink the most, dance the most, and grossly enough, puke the most. Those are the coolest Romans in town, apparently. It was so normal that you would excuse yourself from dinner and be like, mm -hmm, excuse me, go to the vomitorium, great name, right across from the dining room. I'm sure it's a great breeze rolling through there. But then you'd go in this room, grab a feather, and then tickle uh, thy throat, and then make room for even more lobster. What a treat. Birthday parties were never so disgusting. Number nine, gladiator blood. 
When Charlie Sheen started talking about drinking dragon blood, everybody looked at him like he was insane, rightfully so, but back then if you boasted about drinking gladiator blood, well, you were on the right track. Ancient Romans believed that gladiators had the literal heart of a lion, and to be fair, they were in immaculate shape. With all that long hair as well, I don't blame them. So the thought process here, being extremely superstitious, was that if you drank gladiator blood, whatever disease you had, it would soon be cured. So these Roman physicians would tell their patients with epilepsy to chug some warrior blood, like you're a vampire. Apparently it works, like some of the time. Never really, not really. I wouldn't recommend this, don't do this. Number eight, you're in trouble. Recently, we did a list on dark medical practices used in history, and in that list, we talked briefly about how urine was used by ancient Romans to whiten their smile. Hmm, lovely. Fresh breath guaranteed. Well, to dive deeper into this gross fact, Romans also used urine to wash their clothes. So after they were done washing up, they would mask the smell, or at least try to, with fragrant leaves. They would use bay leaves and just rub it all over themselves, which is interesting. They didn't use soap because the amount of ammonia used in urine, well, it did the trick. Lye was also used to clean clothes at this time, but it was too pricey. So plan B was to head down to the Folones, the ancient laundromat, where everybody would just catch up and stomp on their, you know, urine-filled clothes. Again, the smell is probably not that pleasant. Number seven, Roman art. If you've seen Superbad recently, this next one will ring a bell. I grew up watching Art Attack, okay? The British dude, Neil Butchanin, with his aggressive sidekick head that would just yell at you all day. What a fun way to learn how to draw. Well, back in the 18th century, when excavations took place in the city of Pompeii, they found lots and lots of art with a similar eggplant theme. I'm trying not to say what I really want to say here, people. Genitals carved everywhere. Carved, I said. Not just like, you know, drawn in Sharpie. Carved in the streets. Carved in the walls. Just under a street sign, you'll see one of these. Just popping out at you. Hello. Just generations of genitals. Rich history, folks. The phalluses of Pompeii. Imagine tripping over one of these. You do that thing where you look back to see what you almost rolled your ankle on. Imagine looking back and seeing that in the ground. I'd be like, okay, we're just gonna keep walking. Many tour guides like to say that they all point and lead to a brothel, when in reality, these were actually just for good luck. They didn't really have a purpose other than good fortune. These symbols were to ward off the evil eye. Most folk kept these outside their front homes. You know, right next to the mailbox. That's great, it's a good, good spot to put it. Number six, new hair, new me. Glowing up these days is quite easy. Change your hair color up, throw on some jorts, listen to Adele's new album, Bob's your uncle, it works. It always works. But if you were an ancient Roman and you wanted to show off the new you to your ex, maybe at the vomitorium party, how would you change your hair? How would you do it? Well, it was common, but the way they used to get it done was all but. Romans would have to use goat fat and beechwood ashes to bring out those highlights. Maybe it's goat fat, maybe it's Maybelline. Again, like those crazy parties, this was a symbol of status. If your hair didn't reek of goat fat, who even are you? Get out of here. Emperor Claudius III, his wife Valeria, apparently she once dyed her hair blonde and then painted her entire body gold and then had a contest to see who could hook up with the most Romans in one night. I feel like this would have been a really good reality TV show back in the day. Number five, bathroom hangouts. Bathroom lighting is key when you go out. Those 1 a.m. selfies never looked or felt so good. Ancient Roman times, hanging out in the bathroom with your friends was quite common, but they didn't have any neon lights or quotes and selfies. It was just a lot of bricks. Oh, and also, it smelled really bad. They didn't have the Charmin Ultra less is more lifestyle. They had to use sticks with sponges to wipe. And yeah, of course, they also had to share. Socializing in these ancient toilets was like socializing at a Starbucks. It was normal. You would spend hours here and you got done, literally. Groups of Romans would discuss business, politics, military strategies, all the while a dude's in the corner just like going to the bathroom. Romans believed the goddess Cloquina was the guardian of the toilet drain system. Cloca Maxima translates to big drain. I guess when you invent the flushing toilet, you can call them whatever you want. Just don't call any meetings there, perhaps. Might be a good start. Number four, no soap. Sometimes you're in a rush, it happens. You don't have time to shower, so you do the classic spray yourself with cologne and then hope that you fool the world. It's a smart move, but the ancient Romans were way ahead of you. While they didn't clean their clothes with laundry detergent, it's not shocking to hear that they also didn't use soap to wash their bodies. Instead, they rubbed perfume oil all over themselves to get rid of sweat and all that jazz, but later on, once that oil had dried up, it was then removed with a wooden wedge or a spatula-like tool called a strigle. The world's most painful loofah, sign me up. 
dirt and sweat would get stuck to this oil and then subsequently just peeled off. So it did work, but it took a little more time than our usual showers nowadays, our you know five minute rushes before work. For Romans who were well off, this was a whole event. There were several assistants you could pick from all these fancy and fragrant oils. It was slow and sensual. How was anybody ever on time back then? Number three, all the poison. There's always the one kid who's allergic to nuts on your flight. And it's horrible, now nobody gets nuts on this flight. It's tragic, really. Research shows that feeding infants peanuts or peanut products when they're around four to six months old can prevent a peanut allergy. But Roman emperors had their own way of achieving immunity. It was common for Roman kings to seek out and then consume a small amount of each known poison because they thought at the end of this grueling trial, you would become immune to them all. It was a hot blend called Mithridium, named of course after the poison's creator, Mithridates the Great. He lived until he was 80, so maybe these potions that he created might have actually worked. The world's first vaccine, perhaps. Number two, thumbs up or thumbs down. Giving somebody a thumbs up after they've done something, it feels nice. You're like, yeah. Even a sarcastic thumbs up, use those when you get cut off in traffic. In the hit film Gladiator, there's a scene where Joaquin Phoenix's character gives Russell Crowe's character a thumbs up, and in turn, he lives, and then we watch cinematic redemption. In real life, ancient Romans used these thumb signs to determine a gladiator's fate in the Colosseum. It was referred to as policy verso. It's the Latin term for a turned thumb. The crowd would vote if a gladiator should die or not, which is also insane. It's like America's Got Talent, but like insane. While it's nice to receive a thumbs up after doing something today, if you got a thumbs up or even a thumbs down, it meant your days of living have come to an end. And finally, number one, animals in the arena. In order to spice up the classic fight and clashing swords till death action, sometimes gladiators would be put into the arena with an animal instead of another human being. Were they squirrels, maybe an opossum, or were they tigers or elephants, bears, lions, leopards, hyenas, wolves? Oh my God, they didn't win these often, did they? Animals were very expensive, so they weren't used all the time, but the organizers of the battle would go all out for the fights if they did include them. Like Logan Paul versus Mayweather, it's a big social event. Most animals who were used in these great battles unfortunately didn't make it out alive. That's the horrible part as well. I'm a big animal lover. So much so that I'm rooting for the elephants in these fights while reading up about this. This led to another important factor down the road. People loved when animals were included that eventually trade in exotic animals started taking place. This quickly took the hippo from the Nile and made them extinct. Now cut to today, thousands of species are going extinct. Number 10, a tan hut. The Roman army, baby! It's rough, it's tough. And worst of all to their enemies, they were organized. But something every Roman soldier had to go through was some intense training. The training lasted four months, that's too long, started with intense marching and eventually moved into sparring. By the time they were finished, they were able to march 20 miles in full armor. A paid military rank and highly effective, the Romans were a formidable fighting force and an inspiration to many, including some ideas that are used in modern militaries today. While not having a perfect win to loss ratio, the Romans are probably most remembered for their military prowess, techniques, and weaponry. They got some cool spears. The theme, or really their best tactics, was teamwork. Roman legions worked as one. It would make them a very worthy opponent for many opponents. Number 9, Lonely Romans I don't know about you guys, but after conquering lands and marching for days, I would be tired. As much as the Romans hated barbarians, some of them were tough and cost the Romans many lives in battle, so it would be best for the Romans to fight their hardest in order to come home to their families. Well, that wasn't exactly the case for Romans as they were not allowed to be married. Not until the second century, that was. All that unaliving and conquering. And no one to come for you from all those horrors of war. I would need a hug for sure. However, like a lot of rules, they were meant to be broken as some higher ranking Romans in the military did take some wives. And honestly, can you blame them? Number eight, short straw. Roman soldiers were professionals, maybe too professional. In the time of the Romans, there was the occasional deserter or mutiny. However, the Romans had a simple solution for this, or rather a pretty wild one. Something called decimation, or the removal of tents. Basically, after an offense has been committed, you and nine buddies line up to draw straws. 
Whoever draws the shortest straw gets unalived by your remaining nine friends, often by stoning, clubbing, or stabbing. That's just, that's just great. This punishment was not just limited to grunts, but open to any rank and anyone who dared disobey the Roman military code. Cause they're Romans and that's just how the Romans do. Forget about it. I spoke to the legionnaire of my army today, who just so happens to be the chief. You know what he said? That's not it. Number seven, the Battle of Cannae. This was a hard day for many Romans. Maybe it was its overzealous confidence from conquering so much after losing so little. However, after facing the mighty elephant riding Hannibal of Carthage, the Romans were about to get a piece of their own medicine. Over 40,000 Romans would meet their ends in the Battle of Cannae. I can only imagine the confusion and humiliation the Romans must have felt. The battle is considered to be one of the worst days in Roman military history. It's also considered to be one of the greatest strategic military victories in history. From the bad guys, or the Carthage at least. I mean, they beat the Romans in the one thing they are really good at. That's like me trying to beat Michael Phelps in a swimming race, and then me winning. Yeah, never gonna happen. Which I'm sure if I did would shock absolutely everybody, including myself. I'm not built for swimming, I'm built for sinking. That's just how it goes. Number six, the Battle of Carthage. It wouldn't be a good story without a little revenge, would it? The Third Punic War was the last time Rome and Carthage would engage in combat. Rome began the siege of Carthage, and it was a brutal fight. Carthage did everything they could to repel the Romans, but Rome was powerful and was ready for their sweet revenge. Eventually, the city could no longer repel the Roman attack and was captured. The city was completely destroyed, and those who survived the siege were taken by the Romans and sold off into YouTube's least favorite S-word. The Romans had fought hard against Carthage and were probably glad to be rid of Hannibal and his war elephants. Yes, that's right, war elephants. He, he trained elephants to kill people. Like, that isn't so insane that you could train an elephant. Number five, civil unrest. Imagine you're a farmer, poor, hungry, and tired from tending fields all day long. Or you're a merchant in a city who's doing their best to get by. When you hear the thunderous marching of Roman soldiers approaching your position, the Romans are here to Romanify you. Or something like, there's no verb for that, I guess, I don't know. There's a good chance if you don't accept the Romans at your front door with open arms, they would force you to anyway. This means a lot of Roman soldiers dealt with civil unrest at home and abroad. And sometimes people just didn't want to be Roman. Kind of makes sense. Kind of a broad point too, but this is just how it goes when you conquer that much. The Roman Empire was one of the largest the world would ever see. Eventually, she would fall, due to many factors, but the civil unrest was always there. At least we still got the Colosseum though, right? Pretty cool. Number four, Wizards of the Barbarians. The spookiest enemy of the Romans, no doubt, was the Druids. Religious-like figures who aided the barbaric hordes in many different ways. Romans did not like them, and they wanted them gone. You could almost say they wanted to purge them. Like a certain hooded Sith that purged the galaxy of those treacherous Jedi. Execute Order 66. Unfortunately for the Druids, they got a bad rap, as almost everything we know about them is written by Romans, who were their enemies, and they weren't exactly that nice when speaking about them. So were they actually magical ritual practicing wizards? Maybe, but always remember that history is written by the victors. A lot of Romans are great because they told us they were. However, for the average Roman soldier at the time, any amount of propaganda about weird wizard people was probably believed, as there's no trusted reliable sources of information back then, like Wikipedia to fact check, because they always have facts. Number three, barbarians. Barbarians are basically what all Romans called, well, basically non-Romans. Uncivilized, brutal peoples living outside of Rome in the lands that Romans so wanted to conquer. More specifically though, the Goths from Gaul. In what is now modern day France, many times the Romans would find themselves engaging with the people of Gaul. Conquest and assimilation is the name of the game. And like the other tribes and cultures in proximity to the Romans, they weren't exactly going to take it sitting down. Eventually the tides would turn in their favor and every Roman soldier's worst nightmare would come true. Rome was sacked by Gaul in 390 BCE. The horrors. Number two, Attila the Hun. Probably the most ruthless enemy the Roman Empire ever faced. Every once in a while, someone rises in the ranks in history and becomes a well-known conqueror. He ranks up there with the other big bad boys. Going against the Hun was to be a formidable foe. He conquered many lands before taking aim at the Roman Empire. 
I can just imagine the dread on the Roman soldiers' faces when they realized who they were going to be toe to toe with. However, in the end, the Romans would claim victory and Attila was defeated and perished during his attempted conquest. Number one, being a soldier. I mean, let's be honest. Through everything I've said, the Roman army was made up of soldiers. Sure, it may have been a very long time ago, but it's, it's still the army. And I don't know how you guys feel about it, but I am certainly not brave enough to be in the army. All my respect and love goes out to any soldier in the armed forces. Thank you for your service, seriously. But being in a modern army may be tough, but imagine being in the Roman army. I mean, you're gonna walk everywhere or, or sail everywhere, and you better hope the enemy is close, because otherwise you're gonna be walking or sailing for a long time. And as a tubby boy with asthma, I would not fare well in the hot Mediterranean sun. With excessive walking and a diet of wine and bread, trying to swing a sword while bloated must have been the biggest challenge yet. No thanks, I'll pass. 